Hi, my name is Suzanne, if I haven't met you before, and I'm one of the women's ministers here at St. Matthew's Church on the Oconee Corso in beautiful Manly. And all I really want to say to you today is wherever you are at this very moment, whatever time it is, whoever you're with, do you know that you have a God in heaven who loves you fiercely, who loves you beyond belief? Welcome to church.
know you've made a great decision to tune in today, actually. We are in week three of our series called, What Are You Doing? And it all really centers around getting great godly habits in place. Our passion is to see all of us grow in wanting to spend time with Jesus, become like Jesus, and serve Jesus in this world. Now, I'm sure we've all come across those door frames where either your height was measured as a child, or maybe you're doing it to your kids at the moment, you're measuring them against the door frame. That's a bit what the series is like. We want to grow as Christians. We don't want to stand here next year at the same time and be exactly at the spiritual maturity level we are at the moment. We want to constantly be changing and becoming more and more like our beautiful Jesus, not just in word, but also in thought and in deed. So this series is massively practical and very exciting. Now, just a quick mention at this point, around the weekend of the 28th of November, we're looking at helping you get involved in a church-wide hospitality night. Now, of course, we can't have, can, can, can't have our annual celebration dinner this year, but we are going to celebrate and eat and hang out as God's people in a slightly different and out-the-box way. We'll be sending out an email today with more details, so please keep an eye out for that. But before we go anywhere, Bruce has a bit of news to share. Over to you, Bruce. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, I want to give a staffing update. And I haven't had to do one of these for a couple of years, which has been lovely. But sadly, I've um, got to announce to you that not just one, but I've got two of my staff members who are leaving. And I know this is a very sad thing for us. Um, so if I can just explain uh, what's happening, both Kelsey Wilson, our women's minister, along with Naomi Ireland, our children's and family minister, have notified to me that they are finishing up at the end of the year. Uh, let me speak to them uh, individually in terms of what's happening. Um, Kelsey uh, has had a long desire to finish a master's in social work. Uh, it's something she had started and didn't finish when she was back in America many years ago. And she, uh, and I'm very happy for her, has been accepted into that here in Sydney. Uh, to start that next year. And so uh, with being a young mum, uh, trying to juggle everything was too much. And so she uh, sadly is finishing up with the staff team and she's sad to leave. Uh, she's not leaving the church, it's worth saying. Her and Andrew and the kids are still going to be here at St Matt's. She'll be involved as a volunteer and still be around, uh, of course. Uh, but she will be finishing up in her role, uh, which was part-time as one of our women's ministers. Um, Naomi, uh, if I can say, has got a um, different situation. Uh, she was uh, asked to look at a job and she did that and she has been accepted uh, with the Bush Church Aid Society as their diocesan children's ministry officer for the Diocese of the Northern Territory. And so in many ways, um, she is going to go out literally as a missionary up and live in Darwin and be uh, the children's ministry consultant and officer for the whole of the Northern Territory, working um, in a significant way amongst uh, indigenous families and with their kids. Uh, and it's a wonderful appointment for Naomi, and I'm sure she's gonna do a fantastic job, but of course, very sad uh, that she's gonna leave. And both of these wonderful ladies have been here significant amounts of time on the staff team. Um, we will, of course, farewell them, uh, and we'll have to work out how we do that in this COVID era at the end of the year. But pretty much uh, they'll be finishing up um, in December. Uh, Kelsey just a week or two earlier before Christmas and Naomi on Christmas Eve. Um, we will begin to advertise for these positions, uh, both of them uh, in the coming weeks. And if you've got any questions uh, about it, please don't hesitate to be in touch. But for now, uh, Kelsey and Naomi are finishing up and uh, we do wish them well and do pray for them. We're very sad they're leaving, but we rejoice in the future they've got in front of them. Um, God bless. Now, Bruce will be looking at the big idea of presence today, which is basically being with Jesus, spending time with him, or in the old language, abiding in him. Barry Hammond and I had a chat earlier this week, and Barry was saying how much he liked the word abiding, as in an abode, making Jesus your home. Now, I'm sure by the end of the series, you will have heard this quote by Dallas Willard quite a few times, where he says, grace is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to earning. And this is it, isn't it? Being in God's presence is intentional. It is active participation. So I'm looking forward to what Bruce has to say on it. But for now, let's think where we're currently at as a church. Now you might remember in the first week of the series, we asked people to fill in a survey regarding our current spiritual habits. 
And we had 348 responses, which is amazing. So thank you so much for everyone who filled these out. And we can now share some of the results with you. This commitment series, we're asking the question, what are you doing? So two weeks ago, we invited you to complete a survey to gauge our practice across five areas of godly habits. 348 people completed the survey, collecting over 5,000 data points. So what did we find? When it comes to spending time in God's presence, our church prays. Over 95% of our church prays every week, and one in three spend time praying every day. Our habit of Bible reading is similar. An overwhelming majority, over 95%, said they spend time in God's Word every week. And one in four spend time in God's Word daily. Speaking of God's Word, in Mark chapter 2, Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So how do we go at carving out time to rest and recover? Just 27% of us practice a regular day of Sabbath rest. That means no work, study, or housework. However, our Sunday attendance is almost the opposite. Whether it's online or in person, 80% of us can be found at church four or more Sundays each month. Self-denial and the practice of fasting is perhaps the most foreign to us. Two thirds of our church have never fasted for spiritual purposes for a full day. Next up is neighbour, which touches the time we spend in community. Almost 70% are connected into a midweek growth group, with 90% attending at least three out of every four weeks. When it comes to serving, 60% of our people serve at church, and people volunteering within our church are also more likely to volunteer outside our church. And the final spiritual practice is simplicity. Currently, 62% of our people reported that they practice regular tithing, giving away 10% or more of their income to gospel ministry and mission work. So when it comes to spiritual practices that you're living out, what are you doing? I don't know about you, but I find that quite encouraging. It is interesting though, but not at all surprising, I think, that how many of us struggle with the habit of taking a day of rest, a Sabbath. So I'm keen to tune in next week because this is what we will be hearing about and we're going to be hearing from some fabulous people. But for now, let's take this opportunity to be still and pray together. Well, hello and let us pray. We thank you, Lord God, that we can know your presence and be forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus. Thank you that our commitment series topic this week is the presence, being with Jesus. Let's start our prayers with a quote from Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, from the Message Version of Scripture. Jesus is speaking about us being with him. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Amen. Let's pray that we as a church would be more and more aware of your presence, Father, and be touched by Jesus as we look to him as our rock, our saviour and our peace. Our nation and our world, we thank you, Lord, for our Prime Minister, our Premier, our local Mayor and elected officials. We ask you for wisdom, righteousness and peace and the will to work together to trust in trust to seek the common good and to share with justice the resources of the earth. We pray that you will guide authorities across the world to respond wisely and swiftly to the spread of COVID-19. So far there have been over 1.2 million deaths, people precious in your sight. 
a higher death toll than in all but 20 of the worst wars in history. Father, we ask that further loss of life be minimised. We think especially of the increase in infections in the Northern Hemisphere, with nations going into colder months of winter. We ask that you will provide a vaccine. Father, help us your church in this world to raise a standard of hope, hope in you. Lord, cause righteousness to grow in the name of Jesus, our only hope and our great hope. For our St Matthew's community, we pray for all who assist in preparing and serving at our Sunday services, both online and in the building, that their ministry would help us all to follow you faithfully. We continue to pray for our Year 12 students who are sitting for their HSC exams. We pray for wisdom, calm hearts, but most of all for the certainty that you have their destiny firmly in your hands. We pray for them by name. Madeline, Annie, William, Lauren, Emily, Ella, Michael, Ashley, Zoe, James, Jacob, Jonathan, Jed, Harry, Lockie, Emma, Laura, Jimmy, Matt, Ollie, Benjamin, Jasper, Will, Toby, Thomas, Ellie, Madison, Bella, Sophie, Zoe, Mia, Nat, Alana, Saffron, Rebecca, and Heidi. Let's pause to ask the Lord for others that we know who have suffered loss or are sick or are grieving or struggling financially, emotionally, relationally, physically, or spiritually. Let's just spend a minute thinking of them. Father, we ask that you will sustain their faith and give them peace and grant us all grace to serve those who we have prayed for. We now pray for our mission uh, partners, Dave and Leonie Painter in Cambodia. We give thanks for Cambodia's current state and safe conditions with no recorded deaths by COVID-19, despite their poor medical facilities. We thank you for the opportunities, Lord, that Dave and Leonie have had to share the gospel in the current pandemic, especially for growth in the new church that Dave and Leonie have begun in their house. That church is called Words of Life, Sen Sok. We thank you, Lord, for the translators working with Dave and Leonie, a Dave particularly, producing resources to help train preachers and correspondence course on Romans. Finally, Father, to him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. Commitment is made pure in the absence of convenience. Every choice we make transforms us. But what about your spirit? Are you as disciplined as you are with your body? Are you as intentional as you are with the growth of your mind? Are you committed for life? What are you really doing? Hi, my name's Fiona and I'm part of the 630 congregation at St. Matt's. The Bible reading comes from John chapter 15, verses one to eight. So I'll let you find that in your Bibles. And these are the words of Jesus. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean 
because of the word I spoke to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It's great to be here speaking in this commitment series, week three, what are you doing? I wanna start by talking about history and in particular, the way on occasion there's been technological breakthroughs that have had massive impacts on the world. And every so often within world history, there's been a technological breakthrough that really has dramatically shaped the world. And you think back you know, hundreds of years, 1200 BC, the Iron Age came into place because steel was discovered and it revolutionized uh, both uh, the farming, uh, warfare, weapons, tools, etc., etc. when they could make steel. And as you go through history, you can see the way culture has changed significantly at certain points because technology has been invented. And one of the key things that really impacted the church and its capacity to get the gospel out was with the invention of the printing press. Now, you may not know of this guy. His name is Johannes Gutenberg, and he is credited as inventing the first, if I can say, modern day printing press. Now, there were some printing, if I can say, machines of some way, shape or form that were invented in China earlier on. But in terms of the modern printing press that mass produced books and pamphlets, Johannes Gutenberg is credited as being the inventor. And the thing about his invention, it was in um, 1450 in the 15th century. It basically unlocked knowledge for the modern world in Europe of that day. And so the ideas the thoughts plus the priceless ancient knowledge could now be put down on paper, printed and distributed in a way that could never have happened before. And one of the great beneficiaries of that was actually us as the church, because up until this point, Bibles were incredibly rare. They literally were the product of the academy. They'd be handwritten and copied and they weren't able to be mass produced. And there was a young German scholar named Martin Luther who rediscovered the gospel. And because of the printing press, he was able to get his message about faith in Christ for forgiveness of sins and that we're justified by faith alone out to the world. And he nailed his 95 theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg and that material was printed and distributed. And he came about 60 years after the printing press was discovered in the early part of the 16th century. And because of Martin Luther's works, the knowledge of the gospel was printed and it was distributed and it was preached. And there was this great awakening across Europe as people came to hear the gospel being rediscovered. And the fact that we need to just have simple faith in Christ and repent of our sins and God will accept us. And through that, we can come into the presence of God himself without a priest and we can know God and we can follow Jesus and be his disciples. Now I'm going to come back to technological breakthroughs later on in the sermon. But I wanted to start there because what took place then has had a massive impact for us today. Because what we want to look at today is the whole topic of presence. And what I mean by that is being able to be present with God. And we have the incredible gift and benefit of the printing press in that all of us now have our own Bibles to read. And we can be people who individually can be filled with the knowledge of God through the scriptures. And as we think about being disciples, and we've classified that as someone who is with Jesus, who becomes like Jesus and who serves Jesus. 
the start of that journey, and it's a journey we never finish, is by wanting to be people who walk with Jesus and spend time with him in his presence. And I've picked a famous passage to look at to get us thinking about this topic before we think about the habits that go along with this topic of being in the presence of God. John chapter 15. If you've got your Bibles, I'd love you to open up to John chapter 15. Uh, This passage is part of Jesus' farewell speech to the disciples. And it's within a larger section of John 13 through to 16, where on the night before he was about to die, his farewell discourse, he basically teaches them. And he prepares them for what is about to happen. He is about to leave them. And they will have to now take the mission on themselves. And in this section of chapter 15, he opens by saying these famous words, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. And if you're not familiar with uh, the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus is picking up a metaphor, uh, a word picture that comes from the Old Testament that was used to describe the people of God, Israel. And I'll give you a classic one. It's Psalm Psalm 80 and verses 8 and 9. And the psalmist wrote this, and he's reflecting on Israel. He says, you transplanted a vine from Egypt. In other words, there was a vine in Egypt. You took it out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and you planted it. And he's talking here of Israel. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. Now, the psalm also goes on to say, that God's judgment fell on that vine, which is exactly what happened to Israel. And many hundred years later, Jesus comes in John 15 and says, actually, I am the true vine. In other words, I am the true people of God in me. And he says, the people of God are now defined by their relationship to me. It's not by priest and land and temple. It's by personal relationship with me. And so he says, I am the true vine. In other words, I am the true people of God and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit. And while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And his great desire is that we as disciples are bearing fruit for him. And he says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And in this passage, right through to uh, verse 11 and 12, there's one word that's repeated 10 times, remain. And in the original language, you could translate it, the older translations have it as abide. Uh, It's used earlier in chapter 14 in terms of the father and the son, and it's this concept of dwelling in. And what it means to be is in this close personal relationship whereby we dwell in, we abide in, we remain in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. We must dwell in the Lord Jesus. You cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, when you get down to verses 7 through to 10, the word remain is kind of fleshed out. So in verses four to six, it's used six times. But then in seven, eight, nine and ten, there's a nuance to it. Let me put up verse seven firstly. He said, well, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. In other words, the reality of remaining in Jesus is in part an experience, a practice of having his word actually remain in us, dwelling in us, filling us. And think back with me for those who were listening last week to the beautiful interview with Deborah Benstead in the spotlight section and her own testimony about her spiritual practices. And I loved what she said about Bible reading. She said, look, I don't so much as read the Bible, though she's doing that. She said, what I'm really doing is feeding on the scriptures. She's allowing the scriptures to dwell in her and feed her and fill her and friends that's what jesus is talking about here if you remain in me and my words remain in you ask whatever you wish and it'll be given you in other words as his word uh, if i can say shapes us and fills us it empowers us in our prayers such that god is going to hear them and answer them 
But then in verse 9, there's another nuance about dwelling or remaining in Jesus. He says this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now just stop and think about that. The Lord Jesus was loved and is loved eternally by the Father. And he said, just as the Father loves me, I have loved you. You never miss out when it comes to walking with Jesus. He said, so now remain in my love. In other words, know that you are loved in the most profound of ways. In the same way the Father loves me, I loved you and I love you. Now remain in that love. And the beautiful thing about Jesus' love is it is strong. When you are in Christ, no one can take that away. When you are in Christ, you cannot be separated from his love. It's an incredibly strong love. It's a forgiving love as well. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven through the love of Christ with his shed blood on the cross. It's an incredibly compassionate love that calls anyone and everyone to come and receive from him. It's an enduring love that will last all the way through to the new creation when he returns victorious as the King of Kings. And friends, we get to live in that love. And he says, I have loved you, remain in my love. And then he says, if you keep my commands, you remain in my love. In other words, as his love fills us, it strengthens us to obey him and to obey his word. And so dwell in it, live in it, remain in it and obey as a result of it. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. And so if we are to become like Jesus... If we are to walk with Jesus, if we are to serve him, what we need to do, Jesus says, is remain in him. And that is the key to being with Jesus, remaining in him, in his word and in his love. So let's stop and think about what we're learning in this series and apply that to this very important topic of being in the presence of God and spending time with Jesus. The call for the disciple is, as we've said, to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus and to serve Jesus in the world. And the model for transformation that Nathan put up for us last week so very helpfully is this. All of us are influenced in three different ways. And these three different influences shape our life and transform us. It's the stories we believe, the kind of the big picture. But secondly, it's the company we keep and we absolutely are affected and we affect others in how we relate together. That's our culture. But thirdly, it's the habits that we form within that context. And what we're wanting to do is to have our lives shaped by the gospel and to believe the big story, Jesus' story. And with the company we keep, be influenced in a way that is going to help us be with Jesus, become like Jesus and serve him in the world and individually to start forming habits that enable that to take place and to eliminate habits that are actually unhelpful in that transformation. And so what's the big gospel story for us here in terms of being in the presence of God? Well, it's the fact that God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has come into the world and through his death and resurrection has called us into his family. And by faith and repentance, we come and we dwell in his presence. It's incredible. And as we've seen here, what he says is, I want you to remain in me, dwell in me, and in particular in my word and in my love. But the thing about practicing the presence of God is that to do that, you need to be fully present. We need to eliminate distractions. And I don't know if you've been in meetings or talked to people when you just feel they're not present with you. They're thinking about something else. They're looking at someone else. And if we're to be people who are being with Jesus, we need to learn to practice what it means to be fully present with him and to walk with him every day. 
I mentioned at the start that there was a major technological breakthrough that massively impacted us for good in the gospel with the printing press. It put Bibles in everyone's hands so that we can spend time with God individually knowing his word. And as a result, having his love dwelling in our hearts by faith as we know the Lord Jesus. But there was another major technological breakthrough that took place just 13 years ago. And it has also massively impacted not just the church, but the entire world. It was in 2007. I wonder if you can know what I'm thinking about. It was, in terms of thinking about presence, the iPhone. And in January of 2007, uh, the now late Steve Jobs released the iPhone version 1, which you can see there on the screen. And it wasn't the first ever smartphone developed and released, but the iPhone, no doubt, is the one that really was the game changer. Because for the first time, with one device that you literally touched with your finger, you had a device that you could make phone calls with. You had a device that you could text people with. You had a device that you could email from. You had a device that you could just browse the internet. And you think about the developments, that was the iPhone 1, we're now up to the iPhone 12. And you can pretty much do anything and everything with the iPhone. Phone calls, text, social media, videos, photography, banking, order food. I've even got a friend who's got a farm out in the country. It's kind of a hobby farm. And when he's away with his phone, he can control the watering system in his orchard. It's incredible. And so there's lots of good things that have happened because of this. And because of their popularity, 90% or 89% of Australians now own one of these things. In other words, the market is saturated. Now, whether it's an Apple phone or a Google, Android, it doesn't matter. The smartphone's taken over. But here's the thing to know, because even though there's lots of positive things, there's also a dark side to them. And there's an addiction that has developed with them. A study was done just a couple of years ago, and the typical cell phone user now touches their phone, on average, 2,617 times. That's the typical user. They found that with the top 10% of users, they touch their phones 5,400 times every day. Now, a touch might just be a different text swipe or letter when you're texting. But to give you a different way of looking at it, Apple recently confirmed their device users, in other words, anyone like me with an iPhone, will on average unlock their phone 80 times in a day. And so if you take a 13 hour period, that is unlocking your phone on average every 10 minutes. I was joking about this with uh, Dave Andromana, the fact that when the phone is in my pocket, I can just feel it there. And even when it's not there, my leg sometimes thinks it's buzzing. And here's the scary thing. I'm on one side of the screen, but there's a whole world on the other side of people who've developed apps that are on my phone that want my attention. And they send me messages all the time to try and get me on this thing. They're called notifications and the phone just buzzes. And it's saying, touch me, touch me, pick me up. And what do we do? We pick them up and all of us have this habit where we just, why am I looking at my phone? We just pick it up and we look at it. I'm sick of it. What's the end result? We are connected as a world like never before, but at the same time, we're distracted as a world like never before. And these photos I'm gonna put up, you just see it everywhere. And I said two weeks ago, up in the workers' lunch area, 30 years ago when I worked as an engineer, I've worked in sheds like that and been in the lunchroom, full of conversation. This time, silence, people flicking their screens. And it's not just young people. Here's one with some older people on their phones. And you see, everyone is staying connected, but at the same time, we're disconnected. 
And the scary thing is this, and it's the paradox of the smartphone, you can be in four, five, six places at once in the same time, but the reality is you're in no place in any of those times. And you're nowhere while you're everywhere. And it's because we're distracted. And that's the problem of the iPhone. And it's massively impacting our capacity, not just spiritually, but in all things, to concentrate, to focus. And when it comes to the important issue and area of our lives of being in the presence of God, to be fully present with God and not distracted. Which leads me to habits. What are the habits that we need to develop so that we are present with God and we live in his presence? Well, there may be many things that you need to eliminate, but I want to say to all of us, do have a look at a think about the habits of distraction that take you away from consciously, knowingly spending time with God and being with Jesus and being in his presence. Because there's numbers of things that we need to practice. One is feeding on the scripture and having a time each day to feed on the word of God. And let me say, one of the things that encouraged me uh, from those people who put in their responses in the habit survey at the beginning of this two weeks ago was that pretty much everyone is having a go at trying to read the Bible and pray. Now, for some, it was only one day a week. For others, it was every day. But what I want to say to us is this. Whatever your habit is currently, think about how you can improve on that and grow in that habit of spending time in the Father's presence with Jesus, dwelling on his word and his love for you. And if it's one day a week, try two days a week. If you are at the other end of seven days a week, well, maybe a couple of times in the day that you start the day and end the day with scripture and prayer. Another thing is silence and solitude. In this crazy busy world, I think one of the things that we struggle to do is actually to have some peace and quiet. And to actually just have some silence and solitude with God. Many of you know I love to go fishing and often on a Friday I'll be out in my boat. And one of the reasons I go is to catch fish and I love catching them, but another reason is just to get some silence and solitude. And I take my earbuds, I plug them in, and I'll just have worship songs playing as I'm buzzing along, cutting through the waves, the wind in my hair, praising Jesus. And it's just a beautiful thing to do. And it just refreshes my soul. And a couple of times I've year, uh, each year I've tried to get away and just actually have some time alone. And I know everyone can't do that. Uh, there is a sense a, a great privilege being able to do that as a minister. But let me just say, if you can, I would strongly encourage getting away for a day even to just be quiet and have silence and solitude and be with Jesus in his word, reflecting on his love for you. And there's lots of other ways that you can practice private worship with the Lord Jesus. And in our small groups, there's lots of suggestions there. But I said at the start of the series, what we need to do if we're to grow and be transformed and to build godly habits is actually be honest about where we're at. And I was thinking about that for my own life. And what did I need to be honest about? And it was actually my phone. And I realized as I've sat and reflected in the last two weeks that there are some very unhelpful habits that I've got with it. And you can see my frustration with it. I've thrown it away this afternoon. And I've made a resolution to do two things and to start two new habits. One is I'm going to keep the phone out of the bedroom. Now, my wife is saying hallelujah. But I realised that effectively I was starting the day and I was finishing the day, not with the word of God and prayer, but with my news feed and what was happening in the world and what was happening in the country and what was happening in politics and what was happening in sport. And I thought, is this really how I want to start the day and finish the day? And so I have taken it out of the room. I've got an alarm clock installed so that I can get up on time. 
and I'm going to leave it downstairs. And what I'm wanting to do now is start the day and finish the day with the Word of God and prayer and read some devotional material. And it's not that I wasn't doing that, let me say, but it's that I want to top and tail the day that way. May it be my first waking thought and my last sleeping thought. But secondly, I've discovered the do not disturb button. Because one of the things that was happening was I basically was being captive to what was happening on my phone and the phone calls and the texts. And I'm just now turning on the do not disturb button and I'll check my phone through the day, but I'll have blocks of time where I'm not distracted and it's not on. And the thing I've discovered is actually most things aren't that urgent. Most things really are not things I need to get to that second. Now, occasionally there is. But I'm trying to practice being fully present wherever I am and not let the phone distract me. And so let me finish by asking the question, what are you doing as we think about building godly habits as growing disciples so that we practice being in the presence of God by being with Jesus. What are you doing? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, give us a, just a courage to reflect on our own lives and what we are doing, what we need to change, what habits we need to eliminate, what we need to build in, so that we've got godly habits that enable us to be in your presence and to be with Jesus every day. Give us that strength and courage and resolve in Jesus' name. Amen. And just to encourage you in thinking about technology and switching off so that you can tune in and be with God, we're going to hear from some, some of our wonderful young adults who've been thinking about this and developing some godly habits. Let's have a listen. My name is Aaron. My name is Christy. And I'm Nick, and we all go to Night Church. Yeah, I started to find tech unhelpful, um, I think from pretty early on in uni when I yeah, maybe started working at Telstra and had like a flashy phone in my hand. Um, it wasn't helping me with my, my fight for sin, but it also wasn't helping me with my, uh, my intimacy with God. For me, a recent thing I've realised is I'm always listening to something, so I've always got some kind of stimuli in my ears through my AirPods and so I've realised that that's just not really helpful because I'm always just drowning out those moments of silence and reflection with the newest podcast or the newest song which means that I just really don't have a chance at times just to reflect and slow down. For me I had a time in year 12, I was on Duke of Ed and we were watching this beautiful sunrise and I'd left my phone at home but for some reason the first thing I did when we were watching the sunrise was reach into my pocket to find my phone, um, to capture that moment, that beautiful sunrise on something that I could look at later. And at that point I realised that that was such a horrible thing to be doing, that I couldn't enjoy something for the beauty it beholded in that second. And as soon as I got back from Duke of Ed, I just deleted Instagram because that was ridiculous, that I couldn't watch something and enjoy it for what it was. Yes. I do a lot of walking, so I walk to uni, and that means that I'm always listening to something. So what I do is, when I'm walking from uni to the train station, when I get to the train station, when I get on the platform, I take the AirPods out, and I just be present with God. I just thank Him for the ability to learn at uni, thank Him for what conversations I've had with people, just the ability just to be there at the university. It's only a couple minutes, only three minutes, sometimes less. But when I get on that train, there's just sense in which I feel a lot more joyful, I feel a lot more present, a lot more thankful. It's just, I just feel like, not like a robot who's just constantly downloading stuff from the internet. I think for me, something that really helped was deleting Instagram and not relying on my use of Facebook so much. Um, so I do have Facebook, but I try not to post on it because I found that um, instead of my validation coming from God, it was coming from the amount of likes on a post. Um, so removing that need to post and get likes was life-changing for me because that really carved out space um, to seek 
um, to seek God first and to have my identity based on what he thinks of me instead of what a small um, red number thinks of me. Like early, early uni, I kind of just saw the problem being in like a particular app, whether it was like social media and things that were coming up on feeds. So I started by deleting that. Yeah. Um, and then I'd see the same problem in Facebook and I'd delete that. Um, but what I found the problem was that it was too easy just to kind of go back on that. Like you just reinstall it. Um, and slowly I started to see that the problem wasn't just in apps. It was kind of in like the device itself and the way it just kind of like just buzzes d d regardless of what app it is. Um, and just this need to be constantly connected. And, and then eventually like my action currently has culminated in, in quite a radical one. Um, and it's got a bit of a story behind it. Um, years back now, about three or four years ago, um, Aaron actually was, was my accountability partner um, in, in, our, in our Bible study. Um, and he was really helping me with the way I use my phone um, in, in my battle for sin. And he, he, we installed this, this software in my phone. Um, and what it did was it, um, it permanently deleted every app on my phone, um, aside from, I think it's text messages, mail, settings, calculator, and um, my calendar. That was the only things that would be left after 9 p.m. every night. And then the next morning at 7 a.m., um, everything would reinstall. Um, and it was pretty crazy. It, it like radically helped me in my, in my fight for sin um, at that time. Um, and then I thought to myself, I was like, oh, you know, maybe I'll downgrade back to my old iPhone 5 that I used with Aaron. I'll just get him to remove that software for me so I can, you know, have my apps at night and whatnot. And lo and behold, he's forgotten the password, <laughs> um, which has actually been the best thing ever. I'm forced to either go on my calculator, um, go on calendar, <laughs> which takes about three minutes of being bored. And, and I find myself kind of, you know, spending time with God instead in a book um, or in prayer or listening to, to music. Um, so that is being quite radical. I also have turned my phone on, on black and white mode. So you, you kind of see here, everything's black and white, which is a strategic thing because it makes my phone look really disgusting. <laughs> so what that means is, is when I'm using my phone, I don't have this, you know, kind of like addiction at, just by looking at it and the colors that kind of, you know, they always talk about that stimulate you. One other small thing comes to mind for me, and that is, I'm a fairly emotional person, so I feel like I feel the, the currents of life a lot. And I've realized that it's really tempting to want to escape from processing those emotions with God through listening to something or distracting myself through these things. And so I've realized that actually putting them away and spending time to process that emotion or that, or that challenge or obstacle with God is a really great way where His presence, I've really yeah, come to know His presence in that way because He sort of ministers to me in that moment instead of avoiding it putting it off, escaping from the problem. I was just going to say one <laughs> final thing. One, one thing I so would fun. definitely encourage is to like purposefully try and downgrade your phone if that's something that you really struggle with. So like I've got my iPhone 10, which I got when I worked at Telstra years ago, just sitting in a drawer at home. And I've like purposefully gone down to my iPhone 5 because the battery's crap, because it's slow, mm. because it's tiny, and it just doesn't incentivize me to spend much time on it. Something else that I found really helpful <laughs> is using and relying on do not disturb and airplane mode because I feel like the world tells us that we always need to be in communication and contact with people mm. um, but these two small things that all you need to do is swipe up and switch them on they are life-changing in that you're not a slave to a, a sound or a vibration um, but instead you can be in control of when you check it um, and how often you go on it and airplane mode is especially helpful in the morning because your phone is not filled with notifications but rather you can just check the time um, and do what you need to do. Another really important thing for me, we haven't really mentioned it I feel like, but it's really important for me is not going on my phone when I wake up and not going on my phone before I go to sleep because for me that's just such important moments where I'm mm. spending time with God, yeah. reflecting, praying, meditating, reading the Word. Mm. Just having that space where I can com be completely distraction free yeah. is just so important for, for me. And... Yes, and some people are more able to have their phone right next to them when they wake up mm. and still go to the Word mm. or still mm -hmm. go to like prayer and just not touch it. Mm. And I just couldn't do that. So yeah. it was either charging in another room or my apps aren't installed yet. <laughs> so I can check the weather and then it's like, you know, get into the Word. Um, but yeah, charging in another room mm. is Super so helpful. helpful.
because like starting the morning in, in just like a psalm or even if it's just mm. like one passage you read so true it's so it's like such a difference mm. Oh, I find all these video testimonies and spotlight videos so hugely profound and helpful. Thanks so much for sharing, guys. This past week, my growth group and I tried to spend seven minutes a day on our knees in prayer. And we actually messaged each other during the day when we were about to do it, or when we managed to do it, as a way of encouraging each other to keep it up. It's been truly amazing. We met last night, and the first few days... It took a minute or two just to clear our minds completely, stop those racing thoughts. But as the days progressed, it got, we all got better at it. And actually, it was quite easy to work into our day. So as a group, we're aiming to keep up this little seven-minute habit of spending time in God's presence until it becomes a second nature in our day-to-day. -day. So thank you, Bruce, for this thought-provoking message on spending time in God's presence. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next week. Mm -hmm.